Or verse 24, and that ye put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity for us to gather here to worship the Lord. In some countries, they don't have the right to go to church. In some countries, they have to hide in secret to worship or they will be killed. Thank you so much that we are open to worship you here, Lord. Help us to daily up on Sunday to church and we smile and we look good on the outside. But in our everyday lives we, we don't truly follow you. Help us to look internally and see what's new in me and me compared to the old. Help us to understand you. Give us wisdom. Help us to but it also applies to the future, to us, to the church, to the people church today. Paul wrote this and sent it to the church to beg those people to become like new, the new man, which means, does that mean us women here have to act like men? No, of course not, that's not what he means here. The new man means a new person. Meaning the, the things that we do, our actions, should be new. Well, what do we new what do we mean by new? Paul writes this and uh, sends it to the church and they are the newly saved are the people he's writing to. How many of you here have been saved? How many of you would say you've been saved? Okay, well, then this, that means that this verse here applies to you. You have been saved. You are Christians, whatever the sign you want to use, whatever you want to call yourself, but you are now following Christ, right? So we should be like new.
So nu, comparing that to the old, if we read further here in the next few verses, it will talk about what the old looks like and what the new should look like. And that's what I'm going to explain here today. And I want you to look at this with me and to understand, oh, what the old way means and, and what my actions were and what my actions and how my actions should change. Just to let you know, I have been saved for over 20 years now and when I read this passage here, I am guilty. Maybe some of you will be convicted as well and have to reevaluate yourself and think how you could change as well. Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25, what, what is this verse talking about here? Lying, what is the sign for that? Lying, what does that mean? says, wherefore, putting away lying. This is talking about the old man, before I was saved, or uh, before you were saved. It, you know, it's normal to lie. And God hasn't changed us, and so we just lie. Like it's normal, like it's nothing. And people out there in the world, they just lie all the time. So how do they uh, succeed in their business and, and become successful, people use that, use lying to help them succeed in life. I've worked in many different jobs and I see that everywhere. People just lying left and right, blaming other people. Oh, it's really my fault, but they just blame the other people. Lying. But those who have been saved should change that. They should. Putting away lying. What's the opposite of lying? Truth. Before we would lie and we should change in telling the truth. There was one example in the Bible that really gets me about lying two people who were Christians themselves, they lied. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. It's a, it's a strange name, but in Acts chapter 5, if you want to go there, in Acts chapter 5, or maybe you can just write that down and read it later, in verses 1 through 10, I'll tell the, uh, a short summary of the story. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to do something for the Lord. And so they thought about it for a while and heard about another person who had sold their money. And all the money that they got from the house, they gave it to the church. And they thought, oh, wow. You know, maybe the two of us should do that. But instead of giving all that money to the church, we'll give a part of it and keep some of it for ourselves. You know, it should be fair. It's my house. We sold it. We can give uh, most of it to the church and keep a little bit for ourselves. That's right. I think it's fair. But the problem here was. Uh, the man 
man that goes into the church and gives the money, the portion of the money, after they sold their house, they give it to the church. And says, here's all the money from the house that we sold. Which they really didn't give them all the money, they only gave them a portion of it. But they told the church that they had given all the money that they had profited from the house. lying here. So what happened? God spoke to Peter. Peter looks at them and, and says, well, why are you lying? And instantly the man died right there on the spot. Can you imagine the church at the church there, that person sitting there dropped dead. So the people there at the church just brought his body and took it outside and buried it. Then a few minutes later, the wife walks into the church and gives some money and says, this is all of the money that we received from selling the house. And Peter says, why are you lying to the Holy, to the Holy Spirit? Why are you lying? Peter says. Peter says, just to let you know, your husband just died here. And you will as well. And sure enough, she dies on the spot. Both of them, both of them died from lying. Does that mean when you, if you lie, you're going to die right away? Uh, probably not. But God takes lying very seriously. In Ephesians it says, put away lying. Those of you that have been saved should change and put away lying. It should be done. Stop it. Well, we just, oh, you know, it's just a little white lie, you know. Nothing too serious. It won't hurt anybody. No, it is serious. Any lie that you cover up. You know, I, I'm a basketball coach, and I've seen players come up to me and say, oh, you know, just cover it up, cover it up. They'll use the sign, just cover it up. Oh, it's nothing. Just overlook it. And I'll say, no, I refuse to do that. One rule, you know, for our uh, basketball team, one hear, uh, no hearing person can play on the court. They're like, oh, no, you know, just, just put a hearing guy in there. We'll just cover it up. And I, as a coach, I said, I, I refuse. I will not do that. I am a Christian, and I refuse to lie. I'll tell them that. It's not worth winning a trophy and lying about it. That trophy is temporary. Does it last forever? No. Why would I sacrifice my Christian testimony to these other guys to, uh, for over uh, lying and winning this trophy? I need to tro show truth always. And that's the same for us, for all of you. Do you think lying is worth it? No, it, it always ends up failing. Always, it will fail. The Bible says, sin is a pleasure for a season. So, first of all, put away lying. Secondly, let's look at verse 26.
verse 26, what does it say there? Angry. Right, angry. The verse says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. When I was young, a teenager, I had anger issues. Someone came to me and said something, I, I got angry. I would fight a lot in high school. Several times I got in fights and, and got angry. It was easy for me to get angry. And, and one day I really felt convicted by God about that. I wasn't changed. I wasn't. I wasn't changing that. You know, before I was saved, you know, it's angry. It's normal, you know, just to get angry and not think anything of it. When we sin, when before we're saved, we don't think anything. We don't feel convicted. It doesn't apply to us. And we just get angry and blow up at people, and it's fine. We just go on with life. But now that I am saved and I have been changed, what's that word again? New. We should be new. That means that anger should be put away and put on peace. In your experience with when you've been angry, that helps you? Does anger always solve problems? Do you think that? No. <laughs> it never helps. <laughs> Getting angry just makes it worse. You start out just arguing a little bit and then it just increases and, and gets into a big deal. But now that we're saved, we should become new and learn how we can change and put away that anger. There are some times where it is okay to be angry and where it is wrong to be angry. When being angry becomes selfishness and, oh, well, this person is picking on me or this person isn't talking to me or uh, it, he's not being fair to me, and so I'm angry. Well, that's not right. It's selfishness there. When we are saved, our goal should be serving the Lord. Our goal isn't serving ourselves. No, we, our goal is to sacrifice ourselves and selfishness and, and not to be angry for ourselves, but our goal is to serve the Lord. But sometimes we do still get angry for the littlest, stupidest reason. And when we do, is that, when we look back at it, is it really that important, that issue? It's, it's really nothing. There is, like, righteous anger. Like, for example... The president approves homosexuality or the president approves uh, legalizes uh, drugs and you think, oh, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. That's against God. I am in angry about that. That being against God, that should not be. So then what do you do in that situation? What do you do about that anger that you pray for him. You pray for the president. You pray for the person who made that decision. When you get angry against the person, you pray for that person. A person comes up to you and you feel anger against them, and if you pray for that person, you will feel the peace come inside of you. person and still be angry, it, it just won't happen. So first of all, we say lying. Secondly, 
anger. Now we'll look at the third thing in verse, verse 28. Look at verse into a grocery store, you look around and you're tempted to steal and take some things and put them in your pocket. I don't know what you struggle with or maybe you you think, I don't have enough money for that, but I really do want it. And so maybe you just slip it in your pocket. Or For those that aren't saved, it's normal. They don't feel normal to do that. If there's... Um, they, they're still that old man. They just sin like it's their everyday life. They're not saved. They just sin all the time. They just go go through their everyday lives. It's, they don't know who God is. That's just their nature. They're not new. But those of us who are saved, all of you who have said that you're saved, you should feel that guilt. Oh, I I want to steal, and I'm pretty good at it. I can do it easily. I can put it in my pocket real easy. But it's not right. <coughs> Look at the verse here. It says, let them that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to them that need it. You're tempted to steal? Stop it. Go to work. Go to work. Oh, I can't work. I... Yes, you can. If you need to steal, that means you're, you're good at something. You can go work. You know, it is hard with the economy right now. It is hard to find a job. But those of, I've, I've seen those who really want to find a job, they succeed in finding a job. They continue looking and looking, and then they get one. You can't. Oh, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to work. I, I want to take it easy. I don't want to work. Oh, you're just lazy. Work. It's, it's, times are getting harder, and I've noticed a lot of people just, you know, being lazy and not working. When I was growing up, my dad instilled it in us to work. He ingrained it in our mind that we have to work. Laziness was not an option. If my dad was doing something and we happened to be sitting down playing a game or something, he would grab our ears, crack them. He would crack our ears and say, get up, go to work now, go do something. He was serious. We learned real quick that we needed to work hard. I look back at that now, and I really do appreciate that. I am so thankful for that now. I don't think, oh, oh I'm just lazy. I almost never think that. We gotta work hard. We push 
especially men. You gotta stop that. Oh, my mom will take care of me. You're an old man, you're 18. You can go work now. Go earn money for yourself, work hard. So we see these biblical examples here. And uh, we look here at stealing. I can think of a person who was from the land of Israel, who was supposed to be God's child, but he stole. His name was Achan. If you want to read the story later, it's recorded in Joshua chapter 7. And the story is, Israel was going against the land of Jericho. <clears throat> Remember when the, all the walls came crumbling down at, after they walked around uh, the buildings, uh, the walls seven days? <laughs> seven times in a row they walked around the walls. And then they had to scream and play the trumpets real loud. And the walls just came crumbling down. And they overtook the, the city. Before that happened, God had commanded them not to steal anything. Do not take anything from the city because I want to destroy that city completely. God commanded that to the people. But there was this one man who tried to be a little sneaky and took a few things. He went in, into a tent and dug a hole and tried to cover it up. Then went through the motions. And then um, the next battle that they had was against a really small city, which was not a really a big deal. Jericho was really uh, big and they over and uh, it was a big deal, but then they went over to this other little city who, which wasn't going to be that hard, but then they, they were defeated. And they were shocked. How did this little city defeat us after we defeated the city of Jericho? And so they prayed and asked God, why did you allow this city to beat us? Defeat us, and God says, because of sin. Achan, he was a thief. So what did the people do? They stoned him and his whole family. That's a sad story. But that is the result of sin. There's, there's always consequences. Now those of you who were the old man and are already saved now, you should be new. You should be changed. You should. Those old sins, those old sins should be put away. And you should become new. Last one here. at verse 29 says, corrupt communication. <coughs> Meaning, it could be a list of things. Cursing, or chewing people out when, when it's not needed. Well, you shouldn't do that. 
dirty jokes. The list goes on. It could be anything, many things. And I always put it simply, sinful talk. Something that we say that we shouldn't have said. Corrupt communication. It says here, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. People see you talking, you signing, they should feel encouraged, not put down. The people that are all around you, they should always feel encouraged after you say something. Maybe sometimes you tell a funny joke, that's fine. Or, you know, kind of tease each other, like Tom Adams and I do. And it's fine. But the point of the corrupt communication, it should stop. You know, when we're our old man, it's normal to live our sinful nature and, and talk dirty. But then after we are saved, we should be changed and our talk should be clean, pure. Here's another one, gossip. That is included in the corrupt communication. Oh, did you hear about this person? Oh, yeah. <coughs> And it goes all around. That needs to stop. Why do we gossip? Is that encouraging to each other? Never. That doesn't help one another. If you have a problem with that person, you should go to that person directly and say, you know, I, I have a problem with this here. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk it through one on one. Not go around everyone else and tell everyone else about it. And it just goes in a circle. Everyone else knows. That should stop. So, so what's the solution here? One, two, three, four. These four points. Well, what is the solution? Let's look here at verse 32. Verse 32, and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Kind to one another. You could say loving one another. If I really love John Baum here, would I lie to him? No. If I love Ed Arnold, would I steal from him? No. If I love Charles, would I gossip and talk about him? No. That means the solution to your problem is be kind to one another, love one another, and forgive one another. Oh, well, you just don't know what he said about me, or, you know, he hates me, boo-hoo. Forgive. God has forgiven you of everything. Your sins, we could list them all down compared to one person and one sin. Oh, I'm just upset. 
Forgive each other, I challenge you. 